All right, so we're going to talk today about the record-keeping system and why we keep records. Uh, we're going to give you a brief overview of the record-keeping requirements, and I say brief because I can talk about record-keeping for hours on end. Uh, there's a lot to cover, but I'm just going to give you the highlights today. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing in injuries and illnesses. We're going to talk about the mandatory public sector survey, and we're also going to discuss PIOSH enforcement activities across the state and what we do when we go out and do an inspection. So you kind of know what to expect if an inspector shows up at your facility. Now one of the things I want you to keep in mind, and you'll hear me say this more than once because this is the most important thing I can have that I can tell you today, is that record keeping and workers comp are two separate systems. One has no bearing upon the other. You can have cases that are compensable but not recordable, and you can have cases that are recordable but not compensable. So when you're trying to decide, do I record this, you don't look at, well, I paid workers comp, I have to record it. That's not the requirements. We're going to talk about what the requirements are for record keeping. <coughs> Some of the basics that we need you to know is that you're required to use the OK300 logs, the OK300A, and the OK301. We see a lot of people try to use the OSHA forms, but those are not appropriate for you. We want you to use the state forms. Heaven forbid you should ever have a fatality or catastrophe, which we define as a hospitalization of five or more workers for medical treatment. Um, but if you do, you are required to notify the Department of Labor in writing within 48 hours, and we have a form on our website that we'll ask you to fill out. You can call me and I can walk you through how to get to it. It can be a very stressful time, we understand that. We want to help you with that. Um, and that is including anything like heart attacks, vehicle accidents. If it happens in the work environment, you're still required to notify us. What we will typically do if it's something like a heart attack that may not be work-related, we'll wait for the medical examiner's report and the death certificate before we determine if an inspection needs to be done. There may be something in the work environment that either caused or contributed to the resulting condition and we need to evaluate that. As I mentioned, there are three forms that you're required to use. The OK300, which is your log of injuries and illnesses. Your OK Form 301, which is a first notice of injury form. You can use your own in-house form in lieu of the 301, provided you have all the exact same information on your form that we have on ours as a minimum. So you could do one side with our forms, flip it over and put any information you wanted on the other, however you want to do it, but it has to have the exact same information. So it's really important to take a good look at any alternative forms that you may want to use. Then we also have the OK300A, and this is your annual summary of injuries and illnesses, and this is a form that you post and we're currently in a mandatory posting period. That's from February 1st until April 30th. You're required to have that posted in your workplace where your employees can see it. So here's a look at the form, 300. There's a place at the top to put the information about your company and it's important they be filled out complete and in detail. So don't forget to fill out the top of the log with your name, your address, and the city that you're in. You're required to issue a case number for every recordable case, and how you do that is entirely up to you. If you want to make up your own codification system, you can, or if you just want to number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's perfectly fine, but you do have to issue a case number. You have to enter the employee's name unless it's a privacy case, which is an injury of a sensitive nature or to a sensitive part of the body, uh, in which case you would just put privacy case. Uh, you put the employee's job title, the date that the injury occurred, the exact location where it occurred and be as specific as you can about that. If it happened at 34th in Oklahoma, you know, if it's a car accident, put that. Be as specific as you can. If you just put warehouse and you've got a 400,000 square foot warehouse, you know, that's not a specific enough. Where in the warehouse did it happen? Be as specific as you can. And then there are three things in column F that you have to identify. The nature of the injury, the part of the body affected, and the object or substance that caused harm to the employee. So if you just put left arm, what happened to the left arm? You need to be specific. If you put hurt back, have to keep in mind hurt is pain. Pain is a symptom. Symptoms are not injuries. What caused the pain? Was it a sprain, a strain, a fracture, a torn ligament, torn rotator cuff? Be specific with the description of your injury. And then how did it occur? So a good entry would be fractured left arm, fall from ladder. You don't have to write a romance novel. You don't have to write teeny tiny. You can use more than one line if you want to, and you can keep these electronically on your computer. You can download the Excel spreadsheet from our website. So you don't even have to make that up. It's already out there. The next thing you have to do is classify the severity of the injury. Columns G through J. G is death, which is always the most severe, and I hope you never have to check that. 
Uh, and then you have days away from work, and this is a hierarchy, so that's the next the most severe. Then you have days away restricted and transferred, and then you have all other illnesses or injuries, and that would be medical treatment only. They didn't miss any time from work, but they did meet the recording criteria and had medical treatment. So you only check one, and that's the one that's the most severe. So you may have an employee who has days away, days restricted, and days transferred. You still only check the days away column. You still enter the days transferred on the, on the log under the next section. So we enter the days away from work and the days restricted, and those are calendar days, including weekends and holidays, even if the employee is not scheduled to work. So you have to keep that in mind. It's calendar days. And there's a cap. We'll talk a little bit about what the cap is, the maximum number. And then you have to classify, is it an injury? Is it a respiratory condition? Is it a skin disorder? Is it a poisoning? Or is it all other illness? There's also a column for hearing loss. So you just have to classify those. This is your first notice of injury report. And again, these have to be filled out complete and in detail and in accordance with the instructions provided. So you want to make sure that you check all the boxes, every bit of information you need to get in there. Um, the one question that we see left unanswered a lot of times is, what object or substance caused harm to the employee? And if they fell, the answer might be the ground. And that's what we'd want to see on there. It may sound like a silly question, but that's, we're looking for cause and effect. What caused the employee to be hurt? If it was a box knife, if it was a machine, if it was a vehicle accident and the airbag hit them, you know, you want to put that in there. So fill those out complete and in detail. You have to fill out a 300, I'm sorry, a 301 for every recordable case. And that's something we find a lot of times is that they don't always get filled out for everyone. Then this is the annual summary form. And this, the totals on this have to match the totals from the 300 log because you're basically just carrying numbers over. And then it has to be signed and dated. And like I said, it's posted during the mandatory posting period. So those forms are out there and the instructions are pretty clear. In uh, 2014, we updated the instruction package. And that's available. I think everybody got a copy of that this morning. Best logs I ever saw. I asked the lady that was doing them, I said, did you go to one of my classes? Because I'm thinking, nobody could do this without some training, right? <laughs> Got a little bit of an ego about it. <laughs> go to one of my classes, did you learn from me? How did you get them so perfect? And she said, I read the directions. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> novel concept, she read the directions. So reading the directions can help. They're pretty, pretty clear now. They didn't used to be, and I think that's one of the things that we changed just recently, so that they'll be very clear. You have to keep a separate log for each single fixed work site that's expected to be in operation for one year or greater, and that's physical location. You can keep the records at your central office as long as you can transmit data back and forth between those remote locations. You have to have an injury recorded within seven days of it being reported to you, so you have to be able to get your accident reports back and forth fast enough that you can determine if it's a recordable case. If one of our inspectors shows up, you have four business hours to provide us with the logs when we ask for it. My advice is get it to us a little quicker than that. They didn't give us time to look for other things. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you have those data, that data available and people know where it is. It, it never fails when our inspectors show up. The person who keeps the log isn't there that day. So have a backup plan for that. Have them where you can get to them. Another thing that's common is if you have somebody who leaves under bad circumstances, they might take the records with them or destroy them. Have a backup plan. That would never happen, right? Happens all the time. Uh, also, if your employees request the records, you're required to have those to them within a certain amount of time, too. Now, for a case to be recordable, the first thing is it has to be work-related, and that's related to the work that they do for you. Then we ask, is it a new case? A new case is a new injury to a new part of the body that they haven't had before, or if they had a previous injury of a similar nature to a similar part of the body, it had fully recovered before the second incident had occurred. So we look at, is it a new case? Then it has to meet the recording criteria for death, heaven forbid, days away from work, days restricted or transferred to another job, medical treatment beyond first aid, and we have a very clear definition of what's first aid, and we'll talk about that. Uh, loss of consciousness is always recordable. And then a significant injury or illness is diagnosed by a physician or a licensed healthcare professional. Even if it doesn't result in days away restricted or transferred, once it's diagnosed, it's recordable. Now, this is one of the greatest things since sliced bread, and I highly recommend that you take a copy of this and keep it at your desk if you're the one who keeps the logs. Because you can go through this every time and determine if your cases are recordable. And it's just asking yourself some very simple questions. 
First of all, did an injury or illness occur? If you haven't sent them to the doctor, chances are pretty good you can't answer this question. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen things put on the log where they were hurt, we filed for workers' comp, but they never went to a doctor. Well, how do you know that an injury or illness occurred if they haven't been to a doctor and had something diagnosed? Is it work-related, work-related for the work that they do for you? Is it a new case? And if we answer no, then we either have to go back in and update a previous entry or it's not recordable. Uh, and then, does the injury or illness meet the recording criteria? So if at any time you answer no, you either have to go in and update a, a previous entry or it's not recordable. If you answer yes to everything, then you've got a case that's recordable. So it's really handy to go through this flow chart. My advice to you is if you go through the flow chart and you're still not sure, pick up the phone and call. Call me, call Shelly, we will help you walk through it. There's always that one little factor that puts you into a gray area that makes it hard to determine if a case is recordable. We're here to help you with that. So this is a really handy little flow chart. Now, medical care means the management and treatment of a disease or disorder, uh, of a patient to combat disease or disorder. It does not include visits to the doctor solely for diagnostic procedures. If they go in for a CAT scan, the CAT scan came back negative, there was nothing found, no medical treatment was provided, that's not recordable by itself. Um, observation, counseling, diagnostic procedures, and then what we de define as first aid, and we'll talk about what first aid is. So here is the list, and this is all inclusive. If it's on this list, it is not recordable. Using non-prescription medication at non-prescription strength. Now this is an area where you have to be really careful. I was working with one of the hospitals in the state, and I asked them, you know, they'd won all these awards for lowering their workers' comp and for saving money on their safety program, and I asked them, tell me about how you take care of somebody when they get hurt. And they looked at me and said, well, we're a hospital. Okay, we have doctors here. That's nice. What else? Well, if somebody gets hurt, we send them down to the ER, the doctor looks them over. If they need some medicine, gives them some samples and sends them on their way. And you record that, right? No, no prescription was given. Uh-uh, that's not what that says. It says prescription medication at prescription strength. So that was a recordable case and they weren't recording it. Even though there wasn't a prescription written. The other thing is there's an interpretation that says if the doctor gives the employee a prescription and they don't fill it or they don't take it, it's still recordable because the doctor felt like that was medically necessary. So you have to really be careful here. If the doctor says take two aspirin and call me in the morning because that's what doctors say, that's not recordable. But if the doctor says take five aspirin and call me in the morning, guess what? It doesn't meet this definition anymore and it is recordable. So you have to be really careful. Now, tetanus immunizations are specifically exempted. It's the only kind of immunization that is. It's very common when somebody gets a puncture or a laceration. If they hadn't had a shot in 10 years, they're going to give them one automatically. By itself, that's not recordable. Cleaning, flushing, or soaking wounds on the surface of the skin, not recordable. Wound covering such as butterflies, band-aids, steri strips, those are not recordable. Hot or cold therapy, regardless of the number of treatment, is not recordable. Uh, Non-rigid means of support, that would be something like an ACE bandage or a sling, that's not going to be recordable. And then any kind of temporary immobilization device used to transport an accident victim to the hospital, that's being protective, that's to keep from causing more harm, so that is specifically exempted. Drilling of a fingernail or a toenail or draining a blister, gross and disgusting, but not recordable. Eye patches, again, that's proactive. It's trying to prevent the eye from getting scratched further. That's not recordable. <clears throat> now, removing splinters or foreign materials from areas other than the eye are not recordable. When you get to the eye, <clears throat> that's another one you've got to be really careful with. You have to find out what the doctor did if you send them to the clinic or the hospital. If they just flush the eye out, or they can take a Q-tip and swab it out and get whatever the foreign object is, that's not recordable. If they have to physically extract something from the eye or grind out a rust ring or use a magnet to get it out, gross and disgusting, but that is recordable. So keep in mind what treatment is given is very important. The other thing that's not uncommon if you send somebody to the eye doctor or to the hospital or clinic and they have something in their eye and they've done some kind of treatment, if they just flushed it out 
it's not uncommon for them to give an antibiotic eye ointment, and it just became recordable. So you have to really look at what kind of treatment they got when they got to the clinic. You want to get a really good report back from your physicians. Uh, finger guards, even though they're rigid, those are considered uh, non-recordable. And thank goodness, massage is not recordable. It's my favorite. I'm a fan. Drinking fluids to relieve heat stress is not recordable, but if they have to have oxygen or IV fluids, that would be recordable. So this is an all-inclusive list. If it's on this list, it's not recordable. As I mentioned earlier, you have to count all calendar days, including weekends and holidays, even if the employee is not scheduled to work. Um, you can stop counting if the employee leaves due to reasons unrelated to the injury, such as they take another job, they go ahead and retire, uh, there's a layoff, uh, or you reach a cap of 180 days. And that's in combination of days away, restricted, and transferred. So the maximum number we should ever see recorded for a single case is 180 days. That's six months. It tells us it's a significant injury or illness, and it allows you the opportunity to get that to point and then just walk away. That way you're not chasing paperwork for five or six years down the road if you've got somebody who's really hurt. You're required to uh, record a work-related injury or illness within seven days of it being reported to you. <clears throat> you have to have a 301 for every recordable case. And you need to make sure that everything is recorded complete and in detail and in accordance with the instructions provided. And you've probably heard me say that once, and now I've said it twice. That tells you that's something I really want to stress. Complete and in detail. Fill in the blanks. If you've earned zeros across the board, good for you. Get them in there. Take credit for your hard work. And again, record keeping and workers' comp are two completely independent systems. One has no bearing upon the other. Now, every year we conduct the annual public sector survey. This is something that Shelly does. Uh, we send out a flyer to you. Our first mailing goes out usually around the end of the year. It says we need information on your injuries and illnesses, and we give you information on how to log into our database. Um, we only collect the 301s for cases that had days away, so we only get a small sampling of your information. We do not get everything. You still maintain copies of your records. Remember, it's not a... It's not something you wait till the end of the year to fill out so you can submit it on the survey. You have to keep that running log throughout the year. Within seven days, those cases have to be recorded so that at the end of the year when the survey comes in, you're ready. You can sit down, fill it out, enter it on the database, and you're good to go. If you have a new facility or you close a facility, you need to make sure we know about it. We never know when something changes until we have it, when the survey comes out and somebody calls and says, we got a survey for our main facility, but we've got four other locations that we didn't get a survey for, so we're just going to lump it all together and fax it over to you. Is that okay? Well, you know, you really have to fill out a separate log. We don't want you to lump them together, but we need to know about that so we can add you to the survey. The only bad thing is while the survey is active, we can't make any changes. We have to wait until the year's over to make those changes. But we want to make sure your facilities are properly broken out. We have what we do, an, a non-responder inspection, if we have a facility that doesn't respond to the survey. And I had three of them last year that I went out to that the building was locked up and for sale. They closed and moved to some other location or combined with another entity. So we just need to know about that ahead of time. And here's the contact information for Shelly. So you can call her or email her and let her know. We've got a form you can fill out. Now here's what we do with the public sector survey. We look at the data and we specifically look to see what is the state average injury and illness rate or incident rate. Over the last 12, 13 years, that incident rate's been coming down and that is a credit to you guys. That tells us that you're working hard on safety out there. In 2000, it was 7.2. Last year, it was 4.5. That's a great improvement. And we like to see that come down. My goal is to get that to zero. That would make me happy, 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 happy. Now, unfortunately, cities remain a little bit higher. This is the average rate for your cities. In 2003, it was 11.7. We had a little bit of a spike in 2006 and 2007 up to 12.5. It came down, it went up, it's coming back down again, and that makes me pretty happy. But we're still at 10.2, so the cities are basically double the state average for injury rates. So we'd really like to see that come down, and there's still some work to do. Now, when we break out the counties, uh, the ones in green have the lowest rates. They're about, um, they're at zero. The ones in yellow have between a zero and a 4.9, and that's an incident rate based on 100 employees. 
working 200,000 hours for a year with everybody counted and, and what have you. Um, the blue is a little bit higher there at 5.0 to 9.9 .9, and we do have a few counties that were above a 10. So there's still some work for the counties to do too. Um, up in this area we're in the yellow so that's not too bad. I'd like to have some more greens up there so keep working at it. And then this is just a breakout to compare the cities, the counties, and the schools. Uh, schools are averaging about 3.2. Um, counties 4.4 and then the cities at 10.2 so we got some work to do with the cities. Now what we do with that data besides cool graphs and charts is we use it to identify our priorities for conducting inspections. Our first priority is always to fatalities and catastrophes when those occur. We also get a lot of formal employee complaints. My advice to you is you need to have a system in place for employees to report hazards that's responsive to their needs, gets things corrected, because if they can't come to you to get things fixed, they're going to come to me. So we get a lot of complaints throughout the year. This year alone, mold was our biggest complaint because we had a lot of rain last year in the spring. And a lot of the buildings are pretty tight, pretty old. So mold has been a big issue. Um, we get complaints on everything for um, chemical exposures in the workplace, guys working in a trench. Uh, they sent me into a confined space and I passed out and I almost died. We get all kinds of complaints like that. So um, we always respond to those formal complaints with an inspection. We do an annual inspection of all the non-responders, people who don't respond to the survey within the time frames that are allotted. Uh, and then we also do what we call site-specific target inspections. And these are the majority of the bread and butter of what we do. And anybody who had an injury rate for their facility that was greater than that state average of 4.5 goes on our target list. I have. Uh, three inspectors for the state and then myself, so I cover the Oklahoma City area. So between the four of us, we split up that list and we send people out into the field to do those inspections based on the IR rate being higher than a 4.5. We also get a lot of informal complaints. Anything that we don't have a standard on uh, is typically an informal complaint or the employee's not willing to sign their name to the complaint form, which we keep confidential because they have a right to file a complaint with us without fear of being fired or any kind of reprisals at their workplace. So we get a lot of those. And then we do take requests for consultations. If there's an entity that wants some help with their safety program, would like to sit down and talk about it, we can come out and do that. Our consultations are limited because if we do come out and we're walking through and we see a hazard, it immediately becomes a compliance inspection. The only thing is you have to fix it. And that's what you do anyway on a compliance inspection. So um, most people who want a consultation want to know where those hazards are. They want to fix them. And we're willing to work with you on that. So that's typically how we work in PIOSH. Uh, when we come out, the inspector cannot give you prior notice. We apologize. We know that's not convenient. But we're not allowed to give prior notice that we're coming. We always do an opening conference. We explain why we're there. If you're selected off one of the target list or if it's a complaint, we'll talk about the complaint. We will not tell you who made the complaint. Again, that's confidential. Um, we will review your OK 300s, your 301s, and your 300 As. So be sure you have those available for us to look at. We look at all your written programs. That would be your lockout tagout program, your emergency action plan, your bloodborne pathogens program, um, general safety program, confined space, fall protection, whatever applies to you, we'll look at your programs. If you don't have those programs, we have all kinds of samples. We will give them to you, share that with you, help you get what you need in place. And then we do a walkthrough inspection to look for hazards. And we're looking in closets and cabinets and nooks and crannies, everywhere you can imagine. We, wherever the employees go, we want to go. So we'll go everywhere to look for those hazards and we have a right to do that under the law. When we're all finished, we do a closing conference. We tell you what we found, what you're required to fix. We can give you some recommendations on things you can do better. And then we send you a written report with all that information in it. And you typically have 45 days to make those corrections and report back to us in writing what you did to fix it. If some kind of an extenuating circumstance comes up, we do have a process for an extension that gives you another 30 days. So we just have to make sure that there's some interim protections in place to keep the employees from getting hurt while you're fixing that hazard. So that's how we do our inspections. Ultimately, our goal is to make sure that your employees go home whole and healthy at the end of every day in the same condition that they came to work in. Um, we strive to be user friendly. You know, we're there to do compliance, but we also want to provide assistance. You know, if you want help, all you have to do is ask for it. 
Um, like I said, we have sample programs. We can give you references to guidance documents from Federal OSHA, all kinds of resources. So we want your people to be safe because they're working for you. They're working for your cities. They're working for your citizens that pay our tax dollars. So we want to make sure that they stay safe. A um, couple other things in your packet. Here's all my contact information. If you get down the road in a couple of days and come up with a question, you can email me or call me, either one. Be glad to answer your questions. We are on Facebook. You can follow the Department of Labor. Um, we're also going to be putting out some videos on YouTube. We have a few out already. We just finished a Speak Out for Workplace Safety video contest for teenagers that was very successful. Um, some fantastic videos. Those will be available on our website. Um, we do that every year, and we'll be doing a video contest as well for the Oklahoma Safety Council for your people if you wanted to put in a video, and we have information available about that as well on our website. So, thank you.